I'm uh, chairing this session on on behalf of uh, the Embrace the Base Scottish Collective, I think is what we call ourselves. So there's a whole group of us who've been meeting regularly for a while to try and think about how we can mark the 40th anniversary of Embrace the Base, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, uh, and the other person I wanted to introduce is uh, Yulia Limesheva, who's um, helping me out tonight. Yulia is a student at Strathclyde, and uh, she's going to be the one muting you if you forget to turn your microphone off or asking you to unmute if you want to speak. So thanks to Yulia as well. And thanks to the rest of the Embrace the Base Collective. And thank you to also Glasgow Women's Library. Baslane Peace Camp and the uh, Green and Women Everywhere group. So I wanted to get straight to some voices of Green and Women because rather than uh, give you a long history of what Green and Common Women's Peace Camp uh, is, which I'm sure many of this audience actually already know, we wanted to open with two quick uh, animations. They're only a minute and a half long. Um, and they are by Green and Women Everywhere in collaboration with uh, students at Falmouth University. And the first one opens with uh, um, Embrace the Base. So we get to see that too. Okay, Yulia, please press play. Hand in hand, the line extends all around the nine mile fence. 30,000 women. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of women all tying things on this fence things that meant something to them. But and they would send you a letter and say, will you photocopy this 10 times and hand it round? And that's how it went. And people were quite inventive as well, just with the, the clothes they wore and the way that they put things together. And... Every, every single action we did was for a purpose. It was. Um, mm. And we've always felt, you know, we needed to tell people what was happening. So we said, we'll have a huge children's party with balloons and have a party, oh, having a blast and singing songs and holding hands and singing. Shared a little cell. We wrote on walls, sang lots of songs, drove all the men to hell. I'd snip towards her, she'd snip to me. We both. And, and the whole idea was to keep getting arrested, keep getting in, to keep, to keep being in the press, to keep saying, get out. When they were bringing the missiles into Birmingham, the actual missiles, and the group of us said, well, no, it wasn't that big. So they're all holding on to each other, so then you don't get scared. We weren't going to do that. We were going to peacefully say no, we were sitting in the door, refusing to move. And that's what we need again. I, I know you can't repeat Greenham, but something has got to spark and happen. You can't kill the spirit. So um, there were, I gave the Embrace the Base Collective uh, a choice of two videos and they loved them both so much that we just decided we'd play both. So here's the second one. Hundreds of thousands of women all arrived in the same small corner of Berkshire. You know, it was quite incredible. Suddenly there were loads and loads of women with values that you just couldn't disagree with. This was the 1980s. And it's a very oppressive, anti-humanity time, a cruel time. We knew that we weren't going to be violent or fighting back or resisting arrest because we knew that we probably would be arrested. It was the fact that we were here united as women. Green gates were, so that would be my gate. A kind of eco, hippie, suited me really. One of them was very anarchist. My sister was Yellowgate Hardcore. Snip through the fence, jump on the come and dance bonnet, get locked up for a week in Holloway. She just w really went for it. My abiding memory of it is just the viciousness of it and the, the sort of the, the petty cruelty of it. So we got arrested and taken down. They drove to a gate and the police got us out of the bus and put our arms up behind our backs and started hitting us. All the women were along the fence and they started, oh my God, this had to sink. Um, we can see you, we're watching you, and we know what you're doing. What the whole thing was about was about mm. witnessing the crime that was going on worldwide. We mm. all did things so very differently, and that was the beauty of it. You can't fight something that comes at you in so many different ways. Filthy lesbians bringing our kids up in squalor. 
that fantastic last line there. So I hope you enjoyed those animations. If you want to move on to the next slide, Yulia. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to keep my comments really brief because of all these technical issues. I really want to get onto the speakers. So I just wanted to explain why we thought we would have a webinar on from Greenham to Faz Lane and beyond and, and why now. And it's because it's the, for those of you who don't know, it's the 40th anniversary of the iconic Embrace the Base action at Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp where, uh, well, the police estimate, I believe, was 30,000 women surrounded the nuclear base holding hands. Um, I, and it was probably uh, many more thousands than that. That's a conservative estimate. So it's this astonishing act of mass uh, protest and was followed the next day by lots of direct actions. And it's it's widely celebrated as one of the most important actions that took place at Greenham. Of course, Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp uh, carried on for years after this. And um, hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that later with... Um, many of the uh, other speakers, but we thought it was worth marking the fact that it was 40 years since this uh, very uh, um, impressive and important action that is not widely known about today outside of peace movement circles. So if you move to the next slide, please. So here are just some images. You can find many more online of uh, just giving you some uh, uh, indication of the sheer amount of women that were involved. Next slide, please. So uh, the reason why we decided to think about this with a sort of Scottish focus was because it's also this year, not this month, but this year, the 40th anniversary of Faz Lane Peace Camp. Now, unlike Greenham, where people were camping right up until the year 2000, um, Faslane Peace Camp, as I'm sure most of you know, is still going. So it's it's really an incredible achievement that the Peace Camp has been in place for 40 years. It's an incredible achievement and also something that should give us pause because, of course, it reminds us that the front line of resistance against the British nuclear state is actually here in Scotland and um, at Faslane. Um, if you move next slide, please. So I just wanted to flag the fact, and it's also going to get mentioned again several times, that as part of our uh, marking of the 40 year anniversary, we're having a kind of embrace the camp solidarity action at Faz Lane. So uh, Faz Lane Peace Camp have invited uh, us all to visit them on Saturday, this coming Saturday. Um, Yulia is going to post a link in the chat to where you can, if you click on that, you'll find full information uh, about that visit on Saturday. And we do hope that some of you will join us. Um, yeah, but we'll talk about more about that later. I want to move straight on, please, Julia. So in terms of this webinar, um, the subtitle was Reweaving the Web of Feminist Peace Activism. And I've formulated these questions in different ways at different times, but basically this is the, broadly speaking, what I hope the speakers will be exploring. How did participation in Greenham shape lives and activism in Scotland? How is Greenham connected to Faslane Peace Camp, if at all? Obviously, they've uh, one is a mixed gender camp, one is women only, and that makes a difference, but also there was a lot of movement um, between the camps, as we'll hear. Um, how is Greenham also connected to the wider peace movement in Scotland? More generally, what role have women and feminism played in the Scottish peace movement? And what are the legacies of Greenham for younger generations in Scotland? Um, there are many other questions that we could ask about Greenham. There are many other legacies. Um, in Scotland and, of course, beyond Greenham is no respecter of national boundaries. Um, there are many other uh, international, transnational networks or other actions elsewhere that we could look at. But this is our focus for today. So without any further ado, um, you can stop sharing the screen now, Yulia. That's perfect. Thanks very much. Thank you for getting me through the slides in the end. Uh, we're now going to get on to our talk, uh, speakers. And our first, we're going to open with Margaret and Sheila, who are going to tell us about their lives as Green and Women and the impact it's had on them since. And they're going to share some songs with us. Over to you. We're very thrilled to be here. 
and um, to see lots of familiar faces. It's really lovely. Um, when we're singing, I'm quite sure you'll want to join in. Um, unfortunately, it means you have to stay on mute because Zoom is just useless for singing together, unfortunately. But please join in. We're just going to sing a few uh, well-known Greenham songs. And we're going to start with Under the Full Moonlight. Under the full moonlight we dance, spirits dance, we dance, joining hands we dance, joining souls rejoice. Under the full moonlight we dance, spirits dance, we dance, joining hands we dance, joining souls rejoice. Under the the full moonlight we dance, spirits dance, we dance, joining hands we dance, joining souls rejoice. You have to imagine singing that for maybe 10 minutes, just all dancing round in front of one of the gates at Greenham in the moonlight or just in the floodlights. <laughs> Um, I don't think Margaret and I can claim to be, um, well, we, we're green and women because green and women are everywhere. We did spend a few weekends at Greenham, but we don't want to claim more than that. Um, and it had an, a very big impact on us, actually. Um, I was trying to tease out different influences when we heard about doing this webinar. What could we attribute to Greenham? Um, and that spirit and what to other um, aspects, for example, our membership of the Gerloch Horticulturalists, which you're going to hear much more about later, um, and other and the peace movement and CND and all of that. But looking back to Greenham, for me, um, it was a huge confidence boost in women acting together, um, the power of women acting together and um, the confidence in particular to move from traditional campaigning to direct action. Um, that was a huge boost from Greenham, from being at Greenham and seeing and joining in those actions. The whole way of organizing ourselves, we carried with us back to Scotland, um, non-hierarchical organization, consensus decision-making, listening that's something that i really hold as one of the things from greenham is listening to each other sitting in a circle just listening to what other women are saying and not interrupting but letting them say what they need to say and that quality of listening is something that i think we brought back from that experience from greenham um, what else have I got down from there? Oh, we, I think we took those kinds of things, particularly the ways of organizing and that whole confidence and pizzazz and um, defiance from Greenham um, to all sorts of different organizations. Margaret's got a few examples. Yeah, I think it, looking back at what we all did when we, before we went down and after we came back, looking at the number of us who um, were involved in rape crisis and women's aid, uh, in joining women's drumming bands, uh, being out as lesbians, uh, doing Reclaim the Night marches, stopping the traffic, doing direct actions to highlight traffic in women, but doing that by stopping the traffic in the middle of the road. Um, Princess Street. And then Princess Street for us anyway. <laughs> but just recognising that there were all the traditional ways that we had been involved in campaigning. Um, and then there, were, there was the, the whole move to nonviolent direct action that really was exciting and energising and just made us feel good. It empowered us. Mm. Excellent. We want to sing the next song. <clears throat> There are so many songs. We could just have a night of singing Greenham songs, and that's maybe something we can do sometime. Not on Zoom. But anyway, 
Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I've got the cold, which is why we can't do any harmonies. I just can't possibly sing properly. Anyway. They can't forbid nearly everything. They can't forbid me to sing. They can't forbid my tears to flow and they can't shut my mouth when I sing. They can't forbid nearly everything. They can't forbid me to sing. They can't forbid my menstrual flow and they can't shut my mouth when I sing. They can't forbid nearly everything. Everything they can't forbid me to sing. They can't forbid the flowers to grow, and they can't shut my mouth when I sing. The sh the 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 thing about growing flowers makes me think it's um, a moment where I could just very quickly explain how the girl of horticulturalists got their name. Um, and it was a call out from Greenham that we should have a presence and a protest at every one of the 102 bases throughout the UK. And our group, the Horties, um, with others, went to Glen Douglas, which is not that far from Fasley and Peace Camp. And we spent a night in tents planning meticulously and of course everything was completely different in the morning when we actually crawled up to the fence and only a few of us me with my pointy toe wellies managed to get over the fence and we planted a uh, peace rose and the police who came to arrest us uh, what's this you're doing we're planting a rose what kind of rose is it it's a peace rose ah oh, you're a regular bunch of gardeners aren't you so having been dubbed the gardeners, we decided to adopt it for ourselves. That's, that was the, the story. Yeah. And I think just we, we um, really appreciated that the importance of doing actions that are kind of consistent with what we want the future to be. So reclaiming the land for peaceful use, you know, actually digging it up, putting in spuds or Martin Luther King Day. Um, this whole thing about stop it, trying to stop the machine, the war machine. And often the actions that we did were more symbolic than putting a total spanner in the works. But spanners did go into some of the works. Um, and as you know, you know, um, nose cones of fighter jets have been beaten up. One of our group did manage to throw hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of computer equipment into Loch Goyle. Um, but the small acts of defiance really involve creativity, really involve us saying, we're not going to resort to their weapons, their use of force. We want to create a future that's different and we're going to do it you know, in a way that is consistent with that. And that involves Creativity, it involves music, it involves dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I I just um remember one of the members of our group who wrote um for the the Herald. She was quite an uh, eminent sociologist, social worker, and um journalist. And she wrote about the <clears throat> what she you know, how she felt um this was a journey of hundreds of miles to Greenham, but it was a, a huge journey of your soul. And um, just that she couldn't believe she would go and in a hot summer's day, spend the day outside of a gate doing Scottish country dancing. But that's one of the things we did. And it was joyful. Um, and Sheila's going to say a little bit more about the singing as well, I think. Yeah. Bringing back the songs, yes. I was thinking about that song we just sang about um, You Can't Forbid... Uh, me to sing and I can think of times using it to keep our spirits up as a group for example to keep us grounded as a group singing it to somebody who's being arrested in hope and solidarity with them singing it while you're being arrested as a sort of defiance as they drag you away um, and then of course so many songs trying to put over a message to the public 
but singing has been a real um, joy and such a grounding um, part of protesting for me anyway and I think singing at Greenham started that. We've got one more song because we're running out of time. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah. It ain't just the web, it's the women that's in it. It ain't just the web, it's the way that we spin it. It ain't just the struggle, it's the way that we win it. That's what gets us by. It ain't just the change, it's the choice of direction. It ain't just the warmth, it's the love and affection. It ain't that we're good, we're just total perfection. That's what gets us by. <laughs> Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. What a great start. And uh, I think we should all forget about PowerPoints and just sing. It's much, much better. Um, I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. So now we'll uh, move on um, to uh, Yvonne Billimore and Iona Soper. And they're going to talk to us about uh, their uh, how they've encountered Greenham as younger women and the impact it's had on them. Thanks, Kath, and thanks, Margaret and Sheila. That's uh, a joy to listen to. I grew up in Gurup, um, on the River Clyde, directly across the water from Faz Lane, but spent my childhood and my teenage years completely oblivious to my immediate proximity to nuclear weapons and to the peace camp situated outside the base since 1982. And even then, when I, I did find out about it, it wasn't until my 30s and with the horror of my own ignorance that I started to pay attention to nuclear matters, not simply because they were on my doorstep, but because of how deeply entangled with everything nuclear matters and matter are. And so it was actually in an archive I stumbled upon Greenham uh, common during a period of research in the Women's Art Library and the May Day Rooms in London, where I was working with another artist at the time uh, called Shabangi Sai on methods for collective research. As an artist and a curator, I'm particularly interested in how archives can be used to encounter and reread histories but also to connect with people and struggles today. And so my research with Greenham Common Archives has been a place for really developing relationships with different people. And actually this is how I met Iona um, and together we are part of a sort of informal network or a working group that um, I guess kind of expands and contracts at different points. Uh, and with, the, with this group, we've collectively organised um, a few things together, this webinar being one example, though actually Iona and myself have been like, less involved in this particular organising. Um, for me, it's really precisely the kind of unruly and the polyvocal and the complex entanglements of Greenham and its archives which draw me to them. And it's something that I feel that many more of us can further contribute to, whether we've been directly involved or not. Um, Greenham archive collections are kind of collected and archived on the most part by those who've been involved. And it's not simply a place for encountering Greenham, but also these archives are bursting with materials on multiple intersecting movements. Much of what they were standing against, what, what many of you were standing against at Greenham is sadly still relevant to us today. Um, peace, anti-nuclearism, anti-militarism, women's liberation, gay rights, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, anti-uranium extraction, prison abolition, anti-capitalism. 
you, you name it, the list goes on. Um, uh, and I've been particularly influenced by the creative practices utilised by Green and Women to demonstrate and communicate their causes from performance art and performative actions to the beautiful banners and the singing and songwriting and the prolific use of hand-drawn newsletters to disseminate information. For me, I would say that Greenham Archives have been an important place to explore feminist collective research a thread of my practice that seeks to find ways to research with and alongside others based on feminist principles of interdependence and mutual support. Um, and recently I brought together this research composed of different collaborations, working in, of, for, within Greenham Common Archives in my master's thesis. And that was really to give some of these stories a home and a form so that we could share this research with others as well. Um, and the images that I'll show while we circulate with Iona uh, kind of illustrate some of those. Um, and part of the book um, that I made uh, features an archive of poems, including one from Iona who has been an incredible force and friend to encounter via the Green and Common archives. So uh, over to you, Iona. Thank you, Yvonne. <clears throat> um, lovely, shall I just start chatting away and you can try and put stuff on it, lovely. Um, so hello, welcome everyone. Um, lovely to see people, some of you I know, many of you I don't. Um, so my kind of major connection to Greenham is through the peace camp at Faz Lane, um, whose history from year one has been entwined with that of Greenham. And living at Faz Lane, we would often be joined at meetings and vigils by activists from Trident Plowshares and Nuke Watch and various different CND groups, uh, many of whom were former peace campers at either Greenham or Faz Lane, or in many cases at both, um, as well as more, plenty more peace camps. And I think the ways that the Greenham legacy kind of affected my life at Faz Lane and my kind of creative and campaigning practices, as it were, is kind of tied up in two main strands. And I've gone into this in a bit more detail in our webinar, Greenham in Common, um, which was the webinar that kind of initially brought myself and Yvonne together. And that's available to watch on Scottish CND website and the Peace Education Scotland website. If anyone has the time, that goes into a little bit more of the uh, Greenham archive at the Glasgow Women's Library as well, um, which Yvonne has been working with. But to summarise those two strands quite briefly, the first one is very much that kind of occupation of space and the organic growth of alternative organisation and practice. I think one of the things that Faz Lane and Greenham have in common if only by virtue of the fact that they've both been there for kind of such sustained periods of time, is that the camps both transcended the role of being a base from which to take direct action. Um, and like it or not, they both kind of became organic models for practicing alternative means of sustaining ourselves, organizing ourselves, protecting ourselves. And the hours spent on all those things that you just might not have the time or space or forum for outside of a protest camp, that time spent on consensus and decision-making and res residency procedures, sort of examining your power dynamics and conflict resolution under a microscope, learning from your mistakes, often learning from repeating your mistakes. Um, all of that kind of really builds and allows us to build and demonstrate an idea of, of what, you know, what actually makes people feel safe, what actually keeps communities together, what drives them apart. Um, and that kind of understanding of, of what we call kind of real human security, um, I believe, is, is one of our absolute strongest tools as a peace movement at all. But of course, there's no real human security under patriarchy. And of course, the second strand uh, that I want to talk about is that feminization of challenging power. Um, spaces like Greenham and Faz Lane have typically provided a space for uh, a sort of culture of challenging gendered stereotypes from the smallest acts to the most meaningful. Uh, living off grid, as it were, um, often attracts people who are accustomed to feeling quite othered 
And having these spaces of safety and solidarity has been really, really vital for the mental health and the mental well-being of so many residents that I've seen um, who have the kind of space to, to exist and understand and challenge their internalized shame, homophobia, self-doubt, whatever it is. I think we just we really can't underestimate the value of spaces like that in normalizing um, female and queer voices in actions, in political conversations, in leadership roles, in decision making, not just to the rest of the world, but of course, to our own minds. Um, and it's been it's been part of the experience of living on site that has been really, really vital to building my personal confidence, um, not just to campaigning at the peace camp, but then to sort of, you know, re-enter the the big bad society and explore what peace campaigning looks like elsewhere and living in a city again. So in the years since I've left the peace camp, I've been proud to work alongside some of those same green and women that I got to know around the campfire. Um, and I've got to know them now in organizations and campaigns around nuclear weapons, military carbon emissions, peace education, military divestment, COP26, COP27, activist rights and human security and more and I think yeah it's just it's important to remember as we discuss the legacy of Greenham that that legacy is very much still being written every day um, not just in the ideologies and practices that it gave to, to me or to Faz Lane or to you know even British activism more generally but in the ongoing actions of its residents um, and events like this evening are really good for shedding light on that and I think the defining lesson that can really be learned from that is, of course, that the campaign is not and can never be static, right? Uh, we can't ever allow it to stand still or represent a fixed point in time because nuclear weapons are evolving and so must we. Uh, we need to be constantly searching for new solutions, perspectives, new allies. And while I very much hope that I will not have to be, if I'm still finding new ways to campaign for peace 40 years after I first step foot on a peace camp, it will be a large part due to the example set by the women of Greenham, and particularly some of the Greenham women who have settled in Scotland, who have yeah really shown me, even in a short time, firsthand what it looks like to be absolutely relentless in the struggle for peace and freedom. So I'm going to finish with the poem that uh, I wrote for the Greenham in Common project that we did last year. It's called Greenham in Common. Um, and I think let's just leave the images playing while we do. I think it's quite, quite nice. My sister lives in the shadow of evil. She wields wooden weapons and weeps well water tears. She's communed, camped, campaigned for a righteous upheaval. She's had thousands of faces the past 40 years. She's brought life to this land of war, walls and barbed wire. Tired of being somebody's wife, somebody's daughter. She's grown tired of watching as fire fights fire. There's no room in that story for water. My sister dreams of a world free from violence. She will overcome peace is vital to strive for. Echoes of songs, endless minutes of silence, her hands on the fence, her heart with survivors. Her arms reach out wide to extend solidarity, to cherish, to shelter, to turn foes into friends. Their arms extend as far as their vanity, a deception of destruction disguised as defense. My sister fights for true human security, raises up those beaten down for their difference. She fights against plots to take lives with impunity. She fights for an end to the myth of deterrence. This industry of villainy is always cloaked in secrecy. Secret cameras in the canopies, a secret stranger with a stolen name. The censorship designed to hide the lasting legacy of secret conversations, secret innovations, secret tests, secret death counts, secret shame. My sister knows how to speak truth to power. She knows what it means to pledge never again. She could transform our lives if this life would allow her. Now she sings with the voice of a global campaign. Her life and her legacy will not be forgotten. When we take our stand, we do not stand alone because she and we have Greenham in common and through Greenham, we are carried home. Thank you.
That was absolutely beautiful, Iona. Um, and and Devon as well. Thank you so much for such thoughtful, um, uh, inspiring reflections. I really loved the images playing as well. It kind of uh, reminds us of this multidimensional creative character of Greenham, as, as you said. And thank you also for reminding us that you know, the point of marking this anniversary is not to look backwards. It's not meant to be an exercise in nostalgia. It's meant to remind us of the relevance of this for our struggles today and how we can draw on the past to help us inform the present and struggle for a different kind of future. So thanks again. Um, let's move on to our next speaker is Margaret, Margaret Ferguson Burns, our other Margaret. Um, Margaret is valiantly going to wrestle with some more PowerPoint slides. So good luck, Margaret. Margaret's going to tell us about some recent actions by Green and Women in Scotland. Um, so uh, from Green and Women Everywhere and Green and Women for Life on Earth. So Margaret, I'll hand over to you. Oh, and then we'll show a short film. So, um, I was very fortunate recently to be involved in two big events with members and supporters of Green and Women as a local activist in Scotland, as well as a supporter and occasional resident of Faslane Peace Camp. Leading up to COP26 in Glasgow in 2021, Faslane Peace Camp hosted members of Green and Women Everywhere, joined by activists from the camp and elsewhere for all or part of a four day march, going from the gate at the peace camp to the blue zone where the delegates were to carry out their discussions. The march timed to arrive for the start of the conference. We walked with our banners alongside main roads through very varied weather, engaging in discussion, leafleting and singing on the way with huge support and encouragement from drivers and passers-by. Our message mainly about the fact that weapons research, production, maintenance and disposal, as well as military activity itself, are not taken into account in carbon footprint calculations and the huge damage to the earth from the pollution they cause. Afterwards, during the conference, some of us were able to meet up to enjoy a variety of, and contribute to a variety of events, such as marches, ceremonies, cooking, leafleting, kelis, craftivism, oration, and developing and maintaining our friendship, both then and later across the miles. This year, from the 9th until the 17th of June, some of the COP26 group met up again to take part in the FAB camp. That's the Fazlane Action for the Bomb Ban, a temporary camp at Petenwood, very close to Coolport, where the nuclear warheads are put into the nuclear missiles and the missiles into the submarines, just a few miles round the coast in the adjacent sea loch from Fazlane, where the submarines are based. This happened to coincide with the 40th anniversary of Fasley and Peace Camp, as well as the 2020 Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons and the Invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So plenty to think and talk about. Affinity groups represented were Trident Plowshares, XR Peace, Women in Black, Green and Women Everywhere, Scottish CND, Glasgow CND, Peace and Justice, and other groups and individuals. Preparation for some involved legal observation training, planning sessions and camp building. Participation generally involved camp cooking, action planning, evaluation sessions, reflection, networking, discussions, and so on. Collective actions included daily vigils at Coolport and Faz Lane, leafleting, wild stenciling, Two canoeing sessions where we were able to get up close to the MOD patrols guarding Coolport from the sea lock, making and sharing social media posts, including photographs, road blocking decoys and locking on, 
singing with protest in harmony and others, and reading and handling, handing in of a letter to the base commandant at Coolport and Fazley Main Gates. And another march, this time from the northmost part of the route taken by the nuclear convoys going to and from Burfield in Berkshire, this time from Peter Wood Camp to Faslane Peace Camp via Coolport and Faslane bases, taking in the military road on the way, therefore extending the march we started prior to COP26. During our stay and while walking, we were very much aware and enjoyed the outstanding natural beauty of the area, its plants and creatures, forever tainted by the pollution on land and sea from many, many decades of military operations, including the nuclear powered and armed submarines. There is a lot to be said about periodic and extended interaction within and between activist groups. There's time to get to know each other, find common ground, learn more about other campaigns and campaigning possibilities, share thoughts and information, then and later, gain personal development, and most of all, to be part of the bigger picture and able to show solidarity, even from afar. Margaret, that was some lovely reflections there. Unfortunately, your screen share didn't work. Oh, <laughs> so no, Yulia is so just, don't worry, don't worry. Um, Yulia is going to quickly try and just run through them now, if that's possible, just because they're such lovely images. These images are, you know, illustrate what you've just been talking about. Yeah, in different no, actions. Mean. So... Margaret, you're not controlling this. Yulia is, is scrolling okay, through, right, so right. she's got control of the system. Okay. okay. So this just illustrates some of the things you were talking about. We've been visited by quite a lot of interested local people. Hello Jules and Kim, what are you doing at the moment? Oh Kim, you were just sorting out the food. Just come, give it a try, you won't regret it. I don't know any activist who ever regretted joining this great movement that's going on to change things, to make the world a better place. Yes, and these camps just keep the message alive. <laughs> I think they like the pantomime. <laughs> I always like pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> we do have fun. Hello, I'm Lynn Jimison. I'm the chair of Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and I live in Edinburgh. It's the 40th birthday of Fastlane Peace Camp. I come to the north gate of Fastlane Naval Base uh, quite often to protest against weapons of mass destruction and the UK's nuclear weapon system but I'm here today also to celebrate the peace camp which has been here for 40 years trying to get rid of this evil behind us and we will get rid of it. The persistence of Faz Lane is just incredible. And I send you all my admiration and praise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> reducing me to tears. Well done. Happy birthday to Fastlane Peace Camp. We are so delighted that this movement is still going strong. I've come up to protest at um, Fastlane. Um, and where 
they are making the uh, nuclear submarines. My first time here, so I wanted to show solid solidarity. It's the 40 year anniversary of the Fazlane Peace Camp and I just wanted to come up and do something as I feel it's become even more of an urgent issue to stop um, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It is time, my friends, for us to say we will not sell death to an happy. It is time for arms that it's hard to see. For the world can never live in peace while the war machine rolls around. I'm requiring you to remove yourself from this position and allow the community and local business to return to a state of normality. Will you comply? No. no. I'm calling upon the police to recognise where the responsibilities lie. They should not be defending weapons of mass destruction against me. They should be defending me and all, all of us against weapons of mass destruction. But the police are being very careful with Brian. They know he has a heart condition, he's had a stroke and he's quite vulnerable. So that was really good. Doing it with four people. <laughs> I wish the English police were as good as this. <laughs> we're setting off in five canoes for a paddle along the rock in the direction of Cornwall. I'm Ginny and I'm off to Coalport where they keep the nuclear weapons. And I'm protesting that we still have them. We have them at all. And they are weapons of mass murder. Right, move out, move out. I did it, it just worked, it just worked. The, the police boats were just there and I went in between, paddled the, as fast as I could. Brilliant, well done, well done. That, for anyone who doesn't know, was Coalport uh, land where we weren't allowed to be and we were told we would be arrested if we went on shore there. And it is amazing that we do this with so few resources. Now, if Greenpeace were there in all of their little ribs and hundreds of other people were doing it, this base could be closed down, couldn't it? Yeah. Could. And there they are, off. Bye, see you later. Have a lovely, lovely time. Peace to everybody. We may be gone sometime. Okay. Machine, bring it to its knees that we might see. So that seems to me a great place to stop. That's just an excerpt of the film, and I will post in the link in a minute the full um, uh, link. So if anyone's interested in seeing the whole film. Uh, so thanks very much for that reminder of recent actions by Green and Women and other groups uh, in Scotland. Now we're moving after we've just had Faslane Peace Camp introduced in that video, um, uh, which I hope you all spotted. And now we're going to have Kath from the Peace Camp and friends and also uh, Maggie Sale, who's the one of the founders of the Peace Camp. They are going to reflect on... Um, the two-way uh, relationship with Greenham and the uh, character of uh, and the influence of feminism and women in Fasnay Peace Camp today. So over to you, Kath and Maggie. Hello, hello from Fasnay Peace Camp. Um, we've got several people here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, do you want to go first, Maggie, or shall we? Is Maggie on? I guess we're going first. Um, so. Um, we've been asked to, to talk about Fazlane Peace Camp and how I came here. Um, we've got Wilhelmine here as well, who's oh, been here longer than me. I've only been here for a year, so um, she might chip in as well. Um, as far as me personally, my mum went to Greenham Common once, um, and I remember her being very inspired by it and coming back, um, whereas before her, her feminism had been quite theoretical. When she came back, she'd been working with women all weekend and she'd found out what she 
do and how good it was and how empowering it was. And that really came across um, and seemed really um, memorable to me. Um, I had the same sort of experience. I was a traveller before I got into protest. Um, and it was very big for me when um, traveller women started taking over their mechanics and their own vehicles. So instead of it always being their boyfriend's vehicle, and so when you split up with your man, you were effectively homeless. The women took over doing their own mechanics. We discovered that we had to teach each other that often if we asked them to help, they would do it for you with the best of intentions. But we had to teach the men to stand behind us and talk about talk us through what was going on, um, so that we were actually did it ourselves and took took control of things. Um, and that's been really important to me. I've always worked with being part of protests and groups that have men and women. I've always been a feminist. I'm a second generation feminist, um, but I haven't felt oppressed by men within the movement. I think that's just my experience of it. Um, but I think this idea of fellow travellers and allies, um, <coughs> like the suffragists that worked for the suffragettes, um, there was lots of men in the, the suffrage movement and there had to be for women to get the vote. So I don't think I see men as an enemy in that way. Um, and certainly mm -hmm. at Faslain Camp, there's loads of men here. Me and Wilhelmine are very much in the minority. Mm -hmm. Say hi, men. Yay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> so it's a little bit of a different aspect. But even then, the women is, being around women is really empowering. My mum's been a peace activist all her life. Um, I've hung out with peace activists. They're always brilliant to hang out with because we always have picnics. Um, and, and make protest a really everyday thing, that you can be knitting one minute, one minute, you can be looking after babies one minute, and the next minute taking both these things and protesting and sitting down in the road and insisting on that peaceful <coughs> protest. And I think that's really powerful. Um, I came into protest through the eco movement, uh, well, uh, through uh, actually through dancers and ravers arriving uh, on the traveler scene and that huge explosion <coughs> of the dance culture that meant there was 10,000 of us dancing in a field where before there'd only been a couple of hundred. Um, and that really changed our feeling of what we could do and the, um, our feeling of what love could do. Um, after that, I moved to the Rainbow Centre in London, um, where we did a lot of the roads protests. So Newbury, the M11, um, the, the, we basically stopped the Tories road building protest by making Newbury so expensive, the M3 in Newbury, um, so expensive to build that they stopped doing it. Um, sitting in trees, um, Pollock was doing the same up here. Um, the second generation of the Pollock kids are coming through now uh, and are absolutely <coughs> amazing because they've seen what we can do. And indeed, um, my daughter, as well as my mum, is now involved in protest. So I think once you learn how to do it, you, you, you always do it. Um, so... I came to Faslane um, almost exactly a year ago after COP26. I was involved in Ballyhoos at COP26, so to, um, one of the first possible squats in Britain, in Scotland, because um, squatting is generally not seen as the same thing in Scotland. Um, and once we were evicted from Ballyhoos, a few of us came over to Faslane and pretty much fell in love with the place. Um, it's, I like the strong um, tradition here at of non-violent direct action. I find that being overtly non-violent is really powerful, um, particularly when you're um, trying to oppose a war machine, that living here with the base as our near neighbour is really, <laughs> really obvious that, you know, there's a few hippies here um, uh, doing some things mm -hmm. and trying to stay warm um, compared to, I don't know how many millions they spend at that base every week, but it's got to be a lot. So their resources absolutely dwarf us. Um, but the things that we do and the protests that we make, particularly the silly ones and the, the singing ones, um, it makes them think and it's powerful. And I think it's important to be here and to register that with them, that we're still here and we're here to keep them honest and we know what they're doing um, and that some people do oppose them, um, even when it becomes quite, quite scary. Um, because, you know, they do have a lot more power than us. We've had a um, recent incident here that's made us think about safer spaces. Um, we, just before we were coming to the first event here at Glasgow Women's Library, we went out to get the banner that's 
Kate had made from us very kindly for our 40th birthday and found that it had disappeared in the night. So it, we're fairly sure, not certain, we have no proof, but we think that probably that was a captured flag um, exercise by the base who were doing training that week. Um, and we are writing to them to ask about that and talk to them about being neighbours because um, they can come and observe the base, the, the camp it's here, all the land behind mm -hmm. the camp. Is, we're, we're not on mute, guys. <laughs> Um, so all the land behind the camp is owned by the MOD and they do sometimes use us as training exercises. So when I first moved here, I was living up on one end, the base end of camp, almost on my own when people, um, one night and there was troops overlooking us and it felt quite intimidating. Um, definitely felt like they were showing their power uh, to, to me as a woman. So I think the thing that came to that for me is, as Iona was saying, the consensus. The feeling that you're not on your own you're in a group um and that's really powerful and the ways like margaret and sheila said that was really interesting that they were saying they that freedom women brought back these ideas of consensus decision making and the circle and passing and talking stick stick round and listening to every single voice because that's what we did at the rainbow center and i found that immensely empowering um that you were listening to everyone but then you were getting off into your own groups and you were doing your own thing you were empowered to do that um so um please everyone do come to to Falstein peace camp we're just we love having guests we're always here um we we really saturday. need more energy and more more people saturday. um yes saturday. yes saturday, saturday. 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 um saturday. Saturday. we're welcome we try to welcome all people um male female unicorns dogs cats whatever um we're currently working on our safer spaces policy so we'd really welcome input into that not just for how to feel safe for the base but how to feel safe here we had a recent incident where there was an, a disagreement between two people um, and it's been very difficult for us to navigate but really empowering that as a, as a group we're trying to keep everyone safe and look after everyone it was really interesting to me that when i asked for help for the, one of the people that had been affected i didn't gender it um, and all the help that I got offered was women centered, as we do think, you know, mm. generally, if someone's been abused, particularly in domestic abuse, you think that it's the woman. And actually, there's very little help out there for the person in a situation who isn't female. So I think that the women's movement has succeeded in a lot of ways in looking after each other. Um, but we need to, I feel that um, we need to try and look after everyone. Um, so that's always fun trying to be really inclusive and make really simple rules for, for behavior that include everyone. Um, we are conscious not to take up too much time. We've also touched on young women and getting in touch with young women. It does seem to be quite a dead issue a lot of the time with the, the XR generation or Fridays for Future that they're just, I think maybe completely overwhelmed um, by the amount of stuff they have to deal with and they see perhaps climate change is the more important thing and one young girl took, said to me recently I don't have time to worry about you know humans doing something as mad as as pressing the nuclear button you know they don't have the same hope that I think in, in green and women in the 60s um, green and women thought that they could on absolutely everything I think a lot of the youth today feel that there's so much going wrong with um, that it's hard to focus on things like nuclear. But we need to go where they are and we need to ask them how they feel about it um, and see how we can help them and then hopefully they'll be, start to help us and know more about each other. So thank you for listening to me. Um, we, we would love to see as many people as want to on Saturday. You can come and just have tea and cake. You can come and do actions at the base. We've got a beautiful hand-drawn flyer there. I hope you can see that um wear warm clothes um bring bring what you want to find there'll be nice quiet actions um where we walk up to the base and try to embrace the base um our base and give it some love with as many people as come um and we can discuss other actions that we can do if people have appetite for that on the actual anniversary of the 12th and 13th um we're just all as well because I was thinking why you know just so huge at the moment 
why would why is nuclear linked to if stop oil? But of course, if stop oil wars, because we fight those nuclear we weapons are crucial in fighting the oil wars that we fight. Um, so please all come and I'll hand over to Maggie. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Am I on? Right. Um, greetings from Glasgow. Um, at the age of 80, I'm sort of still in my prime. <laughs> and what motivates me, of course, is uh, nine grandchildren and two great grandchildren now. But when I came back from Africa in 1976, after 10 years teaching, with my eyes very open about what colonialism, etc., was about. One of the first people that I met in the small village of Penpunt, um, down in the southwest of Scotland, where we decided to live with our four children. <clears throat> Before I even knew this woman's name, she banged the top of her Morris Minor and she said, what this country needs is a revolution. Her name was Helen Stephen. And I knew Helen for the next five years while we very successfully campaigned against the dumping of nuclear waste in the local Galloway Hills. Helen, as you know, many of you uh, became Peace and Justice Officer at Iona, and uh, I helped turn that process a bit, and I'm also a member of the community. So on the back of the, the work that we did uh, campaigning against nuclear dumping, I was invited to, to um, up to a meeting of the thinking about a peace march throughout Scotland. And long story short, um, this is the root of it. Can you all see that? And that was in 1982. And um, the plan was to also set up peace camps, temporary peace camps at crucial points along the way. And uh, Fastlane, of course, being the most crucial one. And uh, long story short, with uh, uh, the help of lots of people and quite a lot of money that, that we uh, co um, collected and the donation of the Peace Bus, which I think is still there, um, we, we were very instrumental in establishing uh, the, the Peace Camp at Fastlane, thinking it would last for a year or two. And now I think it has the honour of being the longest standing peace camp in the world thanks to people like you and many, many, many like you, who over the years have even had babies born there, you know. Uh, because I was down in Dumfries, uh, my main activity with the camp was every Christmas Eve, my four children would go off with their father, uh, we were separated, and I would spend eight o'clock in the evening till eight o'clock at night, at eight o'clock in the morning, Christmas Eve at the base. And I want to tell you the story for two reasons. First of all, I think looking forward, we really have to establish a common humanity, irrespective of our race, culture, uniforms, we wear, et cetera. And, and the other reason is never to underestimate the very smallest actions that we take if our intent is to be one of peace and love and connection with others. And this story, I think, re uh, uh, d demonstrates it all. It was mid 80s and uh, I was meeting Helen Stephen and her partner Ellen Moxley and uh, Brian Quayle, the four of us were going to be there all night and with some Buddhist monks came up from Milton Keynes. And the Greenham Common women had been there during the day and they had woven onto the, the fence at the south end, uh, the south end of the base, peace and goodwill and using holly and ivy and different uh, organic materials and they've left these on the fence and on the, the gate. And about two or three, four o'clock in the morning, it was very quiet. Most of the peace campers had gone back to the camp. We were sitting there, the four of us, and uh, there was two monks uh, standing at the actual gate. And suddenly a, a big squad car came uh, along, full of police, all geared up, and started ripping all the stuff off the, the fence. I got very angry and I went into the, the, the peace station, which is beside the, the camp there, and said, look, what are you doing, you know? And this very irate little uh, police sergeant said, oh, that message is not in keeping with what's in the camp. And I said, looking at a Christmas tree on top of a coning tower on one of the submarines, which were in, in the, the, the base, I said, is that any more in keeping with that 
fucking monstrosity. So Helen Stevens quietly removed me because she saw that I was getting very angry and not very peaceful at all. But there was a young police sergeant there, a young police, he wasn't a sergeant, a young policeman. And I turned to him and said, what do you think about this kind of thing? When I'm finding it difficult talking to some of the young militants that, you know, we're going too soft on this. And he said, oh, we're just obeying orders. And I said, they tried that one at Nuremberg, son. One day your humanity will be on the line when you get an order. So over the next few years, every Christmas Eve, I did that. And every Christmas Eve, the same policeman was on duty. And he would come out with hot water or sometimes bacon rolls and what have you. And sometimes joining the dancing, and mainly English lads were at the base, they'd come back after being in the pub. Christmas time was their celebration. New Year's was ours. And he sometimes joined in the dancing as well and demonstrated them some of the steps. So I really got very close to this policeman over the years. And we'd finish at eight, he'd finish his um, um, uh, shift at eight o'clock. And we'd spend sometimes an hour or two talking. We'd walk up to the, the, the base, uh, to, to the camp. He would call his brother who would come and pick him up and I would get a lift back with Keith Bovey. So this had gone on for many years and the Dumbarton CND reported that there was an anonymous donation came in every Christmas. They didn't know where it was from. But I knew from the amount of it, it was equivalent to the night shift, the voluntary night shift that a policeman would do at the base. And when I asked him, are you by any chance donating to CND every Christmas? He wouldn't answer, but he opened his, uh, turned his lapel of his jacket and, and underneath was a CND badge. Now fast forward to 2013, I am now uh, nominated as Scotland's senior grandmother uh, of the Indigenous grandmothers, and our commitment is to preserve the planet for the next seven generations. And I've taken these visiting grandmothers from various parts of the world that they came here because I live by that diktat of welcoming the stranger and make a friend. And I've taken them away up to Fortingal U the day before. My car had broken down and I had to come back in a, a rescue vehicle. And as I was, as it was being offloaded in front of the house here, the Iraqi man from downstairs who'd been a refugee three or four years before had since become part of my family came running out, he said, Maggie, what happened, what happened? And I said, oh, Abdul, my, my, heart, my car's broken down. And I had a water ceremony the following day with these grandmothers up at uh, Loch Lomond. And without any hesitation, he said, Maggie, you took my car and handed me his keys. So long story short, the next day I collected all the grandmothers. We went up to Loch Lomond. I parked the car at last. We went down to the, the, to the, the loch, we did our ceremony, two or three hours, went for a cup of tea, went back to the, the car park and the battery was absolutely flat. Abdul's setting was the opposite to mine and leaving the, the uh, headlights on. So several people would try to get it going. Eventually a police car came along and um, they said, okay, we, we, we'll, we'll get you going. And the grandmothers were talking to me and addressing me as Maggie, Maggie this, Maggie that. And this young policeman who was sitting actually in my car revving up while the other one was charging said, are you Maggie Sale? And I thought, oh my God, I haven't changed the details and driving another car, you'll think I've stolen it, all this going through my head. And I said, uh, yes. And he said, I've hated you all my life. And I thought, my God, you know, what, what have I done, you know? And the grandmothers are all dressed up in their feathers and what have you. They all became very protective towards me. And, um, and I said, who's rattling your cage, son? What have I done to you to hurt you? And he said, every Christmas morning, we had to wait till eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock before my dad would come back from that bloody peace camp. And what had he been doing? Talking to Maggie Sale. So this is obviously the son of this young policeman. And I said, oh, how's your dad? And he said, no longer with us, but he turned up his lapel and underneath he was wearing the CND badge. He got out of the car, he gave me a huge hug and all the grandmothers were clapping as well. Now I think that wee story just demonstrates that as we say in Scotland, we're all joke tams as bairns. And as a species, we've really got to get beyond the differences that we think separate us.
we really have to get to that point of knowing who we are within and where we join as human beings. If we don't, we're pretty doomed. And don't despair as a grandmother of nine and then great grandmother of two. I have to have hope for the future. I work for that every day in continuing the work that I do with this, the uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And I've spent my whole uh, pension money on creating gardens with them. Um, there'll be lots of happy bees and bairns and, and, and when I go. And that's what matters to me is, is creating in whatever I can do. And that's my message to each of you. Never underestimate the small things that we can do with our neighbour, with that stranger, with that helping hand. Because if we change that whole ethos of who we know ourselves to be, that is the only chance we've got of creating a viable future for ourselves and our grandchildren. So here ends the lesson, Maggie Sale. And uh, you're all welcome, Ben the Hoost, as we say here. I also have a lovely village home down in Dumfries and Galloway where I met Helen Stephen. And uh, I've since stopped taking Airbnb guests. I'm going to use it now for people like yourselves that need a wee bit of respite. Or, and a lot of the refugees and asylum seekers go down there anyway. And uh, so you're welcome, Ben the Hoost, anytime. I live in Ibrox in Glasgow, uh, right beside the football ground. You can't miss it. And uh, you'll always find a jewelry piece at my Glasgow door. Bless you all for the work you continue doing. Thank you so much. That was, people are clapping you. That was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so, um, yeah, a story of human connection there, I think, that was really a good one to hear. Uh, and also you've woven us through the Greenham camp. You brought the Greenham campers up to Faz Lane and then told us how that's... Uh, shaped you know how that continues to shape your activism today and thanks also to Kath for uh telling us about life in the camp now uh that was really fascinating to hear and I really hope uh, uh that lots of you will join us visiting the camp and the base on Saturday so uh we must move on now let's our next speakers are from Scottish CND uh so we've got Isabel Lindsay and Lynn Jameson and they're going to talk to us about um, the influence of Greenham or the lack of it on the broader Scottish peace movement and the role of women in that movement and their memories of Greenham and whatever else they want to talk about. So over to you. Okay. Uh, well, I'll uh, kick off being the, the oldest <laughs> in experience. The first big wave of anti-nuclear activity in Scotland was, of course, 19 end of 1960, 61, 62, with the arrival uh, of uh, Polaris in the Holy Loch. And it was a major campaign, both conventional, but also direct action uh, that I was involved in, in all of that. And there were about 300 of us arrested in October uh, 61 uh, at the base. Now, uh, I, I think one of the interesting things in a way uh, that I'd like to address briefly uh, is why in Scotland we didn't have a, a, a major distinct women's uh, protest movement, anti-nuclear protest movement. We had, uh, as we've seen, we had various activities here and there, but um, it, it was very integrated. And I think, I'm only speculating here, that one of the reasons for it was uh, the fact that the movement in Scotland was much more integrated into major civic institutions in Scotland. And if you look at the pictures of the first demonstrations uh, immediately after the announcement uh, in at the end of 1960 that we were going to get uh, a big nuclear base in, in Scotland in three months. <laughs> uh, it was overwhelmingly male that you see in those pictures. Now, it wasn't that there were a lot, weren't a lot of active individual women, but you had the institutions, particularly uh, the trade unions, uh, and that time large sections of the Labour Party, 
and you also had some sections, particularly the Iona community, off the church. And of course, the Iona community then <laughs> didn't allow women to be full members. Um, so it was overwhelmingly male. You know, if you look at the uh, the images uh, from the time, although with some very active women, and. Uh, I think if we jump forward, because what of course happened is these things come in, in waves. The next big wave was the beginning of the 80s. And it does take something to trigger these waves. Uh, it, it's not that activity doesn't continue through the late 60s through the 70s, but it was much more subdued level. Oh, the one interesting thing, of course, which happened during the 70s was the big emergence of the Scottish National Party and, uh, and, and it was anti-nuclear. Uh, but the reason why you had the big emergence in the 80s, both here in England, throughout Europe, was the new initiatives. Now, in Scotland, it was very much the announcement that came in 1980, 81, uh, that the uh, not only were we going to continue with Polaris, but we're going to have this major, new, much larger, uh, much more potentially destructive because of the individual targeting Trident. Now, it took them 14 years from that announcement to actually convert and build the base because Trident was much bigger. Um, but that triggered a new wave of activism in Scotland, uh, just as it was Pershing cruise you know, missiles uh, down south and in various parts of Europe, which gave us at that same time as Greenham and the activities here, uh, the, the big movements in Germany and uh, Netherlands and uh, uh, various other parts of, uh, uh, of Europe. But in Scotland, during those 80s, although we saw Greenham, uh, there were individuals we knew taking part in Greenham, but there was never any push in Scotland for a distinctive um, women's movement, uh, 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 anti-nuclear kind of section here. And uh, we, we did have one of the, the, the innovative new groups was Parents for Survival, but by definition, <laughs> um, they did a lot in that period. Uh, now, I think one of the reasons there that differed from a lot of the situation that was in, in England was that we had most of the big unions in Scotland actively you know, involved. At that time, it uh, seems an awful long time ago, if you remember Michael Foote was leader of the Labour Party, the Labour Party in Scotland, uh, you wouldn't have got, got elect, selected as a candidate there if you hadn't said you were really strongly anti-nuclear, how quickly that changed. Uh, so, But the Labour Party rank and file was very active. The SNP, of course, had got much larger than the 1960s. It was very active. The churches in Scotland, unlike England, the Catholic Bishops' Conference in the early 80s came out, unlike England, and said basically they were against the bomb. And of course, the Church of Scotland, you know, at long last, came off the, the fence and officially became anti nuclear. Um, so we were operating in a situation where we were very much integrated with the main civic institutions here. And I think that is why the movement kind of developed in that way, rather than, than um, the, you know, the situation that had produced uh, the, the, the Greenham situation. Uh, we admired it, we saw it, we supported it, but there was no drive here you know, to have that kind of thing. We had all the demos at the bases and, uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, so I think there is something interesting to study there and examine and explore why things didn't take that turn in Scotland. And of course, the unfortunate thing, uh, you, you know, we're back to, we're living in it, 
uh, is that these things do come in, in, in waves. And we had the waves in the, the 80s, and then uh, that, that dropped away. Didn't it never disappears, but dropped away. And then it wasn't until uh, the wars in the, the 90s, um, uh, we did a lot of activity during the, the 90s, but at the end of the 90s, uh, it became more the, the big anti-war movement uh, uh, protests, but which were very much linked with nearly everyone involved in the anti-war movement protests were also anti-nuclear. Um, so we had those great big uh, developments at that period. And we're now in one of those, we've been uh, certainly for a decade or more, in one of these periods where there's been very little uh, highlighting of the anti-nuclear issue, at least as in terms of mass protest, it's been there, but so much of the emphasis has moved uh, towards, as has been uh, said, uh, um, as Kath has said, uh, has moved towards the, the, the climate action, etc. So just to say, um, it's not very inspirational, <laughs> but I think it's useful for us to see some of these things. Uh, plenty of women doing smaller events, plenty of women activists, but not the distinctive, separate, large scale, you know, you know women's protest that was Greenham. Thanks. And uh, Lynn? Yes, I don't want to say very much, but I mean, I did go to Greenham. Um, I was certainly there at the Embrace the Base. I think I was also there at the Hands Around the Base, although I have to say I never kept diaries of that time. And I'm not completely sure whether it was that that I was at or whether it was the time of linking Burfield um, in Aldermaston and whether I've got these events confused, I'm not completely sure, but I was definitely at um, Greenham at the Embrace the Base. And I know that I, for years I had a piece of fence. It was a green, it was a zigzag of green plastic coated fence that I'd brought back and I tried to keep it. And I think it's got eventually got lost, but I had it for at least 20 years. <laughs> Um, but now I don't think I've got it anymore. I couldn't find it the other day. But, um, and it was, of course, extremely influential. I was already, I was certainly already feminist, was involved in campaign abortion, and, you know, the pro-life, not pro-life, the pro-choice uh, campaign. I was involved in, um, you know, I took part in all kinds of feminist things. Um, but I didn't actually, and I was in a consciousness raising group, but I didn't actually know many other women who were, um, like I didn't then know Sheila and Margaret. I didn't know uh, Maggie. Um, I did. I wish I'd known those people that 40 years ago. I would really do um, because things, I, who knows what things would have been like. But anyway, um, my first involvement in the peace movement was actually called um, Lothians Against the War Drive, it was called, before it was called Edinburgh c &D, and it was started when, when we started to hear about cruise missiles coming and the, mod, the new accuracy of the, the new missiles and the new Trident and all of that. Um, so I think it was about 79, 80, I can't actually remember for sure. Um, and I know that Ian Davison and Keith Bovey came through from Scottish CND um, to try and persuade us to become a CND group. Um, and eventually um, I got absorbed into Scottish CND. So I went from becoming a chair of Edinburgh CND to being involved in Scottish CND. And I have to say that I don't think it was a very feminist organization at the time. And um, I did have a few struggles with some things, um, but I think it did become more feminist informed. Um, I mean, I remember an argument about peace to all men on the Christmas card that people just could not quite see what I was talking about. <laughs> people who would now laugh at the at themselves, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, the women that I knew 
that we're involved in the peace movement, as Isabel says, we're all involved in other campaigns. They were all involved in multiple things. And um, there was though, I don't know if anyone here can remember, there was a peace camp started at Recythe for a while. I can't remember whether that was a mixed camp or a women only camp. I don't know if anyone else can remember. Was there I ever think, a women only I camp? I believe it was a women's only camp, the one at Recythe. That's what I thought too. I thought it was, but I wasn't absolutely sure. I mean, I remember trying to give it support, but I can't remember. And I know it didn't last enormously long, but I know we went there in support several times. So, yeah. It was so, a women's only camp. It was. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there was, there were efforts. Um, and there's absolutely no doubt about how influential Fastlane was. Um, and and it was true when you went as a CND person anywhere in the, you know, I went on a few trips once I got involved into UK CND. At one, I went with a UK CND delegation to Japan at one point. And, you know, people would come and talk to you about Greenham. Greenham, that's what they knew about. They didn't know about CND, they knew about Greenham. So it was incredibly influential. Anyway, that's all I want to say. I just, um, I'm incredible. Well, no, there's one other thing that must say. I'm incredibly grateful to Fastlane for survival. Um, and I think it's very hard um, to, you know, pay full to pay full enough um, tribute to that. It's, uh, it is an incredible achievement just carrying on. Um, it really is in pretty difficult, constantly difficult conditions. So although there's, you know, obviously people who are there now are not the people who were there 40 years ago, but the fact that they're there at all is an, an absolutely immense achievement. Thank you very much uh, to Lynn and Isabel for you know, um, tracing some more of the, the web woven in the wider peace movement. I think that was very informative. And I, I didn't know about that Rosyth camp, so I'm off to go and look that up uh, when I get a moment. I'm very interested in that. Um, and some uh, a, a really... Um, useful mix there of both personal your personal stories and journeys and how you came to this and how you interacted with Greenham and also a kind of broader analysis I think of um, how the Scottish peace movement developed uh, fascinating thanks very much I'm aware time is is going on as as is to be anticipated in these kinds of events everyone's had more to say than our time really allowed so uh, without further ado let's move on to Joyce and Adrian who are going to talk to the theme of women acting now so we've been talking a bit uh, about the um, past and about the uh, trajectory of the Scottish peace movement and at Faslane Peace Camp um, Joyce and Adrian are going to talk about the influence of Greenham on the Gerlock horticulturalists. So over to you. And just to say, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear all these stories from all you amazing women. And, and, and I think I'm sitting here feeling a bit nervous and a bit fraudulent because I think our talk's women acting now, and that's all we've heard about. So we've heard about all that hair study, but actually you're all doing this piece work right now. So thank you. For that um, um, and so what we were going to talk about and we have uh, there's five of us here on on this uh, so you know me and Adrian have got our mics off but you know Margaret and Sheila are here and Isabel is also here who's a hort and uh, we thought we would just talk about some of the stuff that we've been up to over the last few while and as Margaret and Sheila so beautifully said um, the horts really um, embodies the collective creative listening sense that comes um, from the spirit of Greenham um, and many of the women in the horse uh, were at Greenham at various points and um, you know one, one of the women in the group um, still there and, and these iconic pictures aren't they just amazing so yeah 
Next slide, it's absolutely fine. So there's just a few pictures of um, various members um, of the 40th um, at the at Greenham. So, but certainly this is um, um, some pictures of the camp. Thank you, Julia. And, and, and a, a, a press piece by, by Key about um, going down to Greenham. So again, another another haughty mm -hmm. woman um, that many of you will know. Thanks, Julia. Yep, these are these are from the archives of of, of Margaret Sheila, and of course, two women that I know many of you will know um, very deep in your hearts. And 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 I think this certainly for me, and I've only been a haughty for about eight years or something, seven or eight years, so I. I still feel very new, <laughs> um, but this wonderful quote that I think really summarises the importance of non-violence um, from Helen, um, Helen Stephen, um, that non-violence is about revolution. It's about finding creative, imaginative ways to overthrow all forms of tyranny and oppression without becoming the oppressor in the process. And I think so many of you have told mm -hmm. such beautiful stories about that tonight. Um, Particularly, I'm thinking about Maggie's story. That's lovely. Yeah, about, uh, Helen. about yeah. and about Helen, yeah. yeah. And it widens the uh, options and holds out the possibility yeah. of a way out of the cycle of violence where dignity can be maintained. So, I think that really is at the heart of, of what we're trying trying to be. And and it, and, it, and it's lovely to have Helen's voice um, here tonight to share with you. Okay, thanks, Julia. So one of the first actions I was involved in it was this kind of um, massive, <laughs> absolutely crazy um, um, blockade, I think of the oil gate, um, um, where we were being bought, bairns not, uh, bairns not bombs. And uh, we all dressed up as bairns. Um, and uh, it was the most interesting toilet stop I think I've ever made, mm -hmm. maybe in the Jew Yeah, absolutely. Where we all had various things and nappies uh, to, to look on with. And, some wonderful woman who lives quite near there had allowed us to all go and use her toilet at various yeah. points in the morning. And um, and it was just utterly fantastic that um, she opened our door to let us all use her toilet. And then, of course, we all had to take off our onesies and our nappies and all these chains and padlocks. And she just said, well, you're an interesting bunch of children, aren't you? So that's that's one of my favourite memories, my early memories of that time of the horse. So, um, Thanks, Julia. Um, we also do a lot of, um, I suppose, trying to engage with public. So, you know, more, more kind of general um, trying to engage. And this was one of, um, I mean, just beautiful banners, oh. aren't they? Um, so a lot of creative energy around um, putting this thread together. But that, this was actually called Common Threads. And this was trying to, I suppose, make the links, as some people have already spoken today about, um, you know, poverty and um, the eco disaster, um, the cl climate justice um, and, and nuclear weapons and how they all connect really deeply with one another. Thanks, Julia. Um, and uh, I'm just going to start a little thread about ABBA. So we all became ABBA and we've had several incarnations of ABBA. Um, I'm not always wearing those gold shoes, thank goodness. That was a... Uh, <laughs> Get get potentially next to them was good. So, um, so we visited all the consulates in Edinburgh, including the UK consulate. But this was this was about changing the words of an ABBA song, um, to make um a choice for peace instead of what was it? Shake a chance. chance. Well, you'll recognise it in a yeah. minute because we're going to hopefully play a video that went to um of us all looking fabulous. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so ABBA obviously stands for Abominable Bombs Ban Agreed. So, um, yeah, and here we are at, at the, yeah, there, there we are at the, the Home Office. We visited various consulates that day. And then we took ABBA on tour. So here we are at, at, at the gates of Faslane. Uh, okay, and, and so some, you know, so we, we do a lot of singing and dancing and being creative. We also do some fasting. So here's Ellen, um, many of you will know Ellen really well, um, well have known Ellen really well, um, fasting um, in between the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki outside the Scottish Parliament. Um, so yeah, quietness is also something that we do. Um, thanks Julia. 
And our peace tree, um, many of you will um, know peace cranes very well. <laughs> um, and this display has been inside and outside the Scottish Parliament and various other places ar around Scotland. And, and again, it's a way of connecting and, and um, having conversations with people. Um, yeah, thank you, Yulia. We also, of course, like many others, uh, I'm sure on this um, uh, tonight, um, um, do Women in Black. Um, and uh, this is at the Cenotaph in Glasgow, um, mourning all casualties of war, all human and animal lives and the environment, all tolerance and trust. Thank you, Yulia. And we've also made things like gigantic uh, trident submarines that we've taken on tour of various places. Um, Gobble up lots of things and um, I think shit out bombs is the only mm -hmm. yeah and we again it's a it's a way to try and engage people um um so yeah we've got um and I, I think Carly and several other members of the group made that out of sleeping bags so quite complicated but um it's very good fun yeah and we've taken that to various places including to the base um obviously we thank you Yulia we've engaged in the the kind of ban array. Well done. Um, and uh, thanks, Julia. We we had a puppet show at COP26. Um, magnificent Greta there, and obviously um a bit of Boris. Um <laughs> so puppet shows are, are another way of just engaging people um and uh, get getting some conversations going. Thank you, Julia. Also, we've asked people to vote with their heart on Valentine's Day. We quite often have an action in February. Uh, you know, what would you spend, you know, two hundred billion pounds on, or whatever, whatever the current estimate of how much these monstrosities cost. And I think my favourite one was, I'd spend it on jelly babies, or you know, whatever, like just whatever doesn't matter. Um, so again, another yeah, and and just standing in vigil again, the wonderful Sally, um, again that many of you will, will remember very fondly. Thanks, Julia. And just, oh yeah, season's greetings is the time of year. Get people to come and, and um, fill in Christmas cards that we can we can send to MPs, MSPs. Um, yeah, supporting the, the, the ban on nuclear weapons. Thank you, Julia. And finally, I think, yeah, Margaret and Sheila, um, I think, talked a wee bit about this, and or somebody has tonight, um, the kind of action that we did alongside um, other um, in collaboration with other Trident Plowshares groups and other peace groups, Peace and Justice in uh, Centre on Edinburgh, with the 140,000 peace cranes that were made. Um, and there's just one last slide, which um, is us at the peace camp recently for one of the, bir the birthday party weekends. So, you know, all, I mean, it's just incredible that that's still there and going strong. And, and thank you, Kath, and everyone else that's been involved with that over the years. And, and we left a little um a little for sale sign um saying that 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 the base is um you know up for sale um crusty old weapon system um for for billions of pounds for sale so so thank you i mean that that's just say that's some of the stuff that we get up to and really um we're acting in peace with lots of you tonight so thank you very 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 much uh for giving us the opportunity just to see a wee bit about what we're up to. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful presentation to end on. Uh, you've shown not only the amazing persistence of Green and Women and you know, those that have come after, uh, but also such humour, creativity and, and joyousness, really, in some of those images. And I'd really strongly encourage people to check out those videos. What a shame, especially the other one because, um, yeah, that's definitely, definitely worth saying. And, um, it's it's nine o'clock, so I'm afraid we have to wrap without um, a discussion, um, but I hope you'll all agree it was worth it for these wonderful presentations. We'll have to have another one where we can uh, have more of an interactive discussion with each other. Um, but I hope that everyone will um, join me in thanking our wonderful presenters. You've really... Uh, really have kind of woven this web 
uh, from Greenham outwards. We've ranged far and wide. And what I really liked, actually, is we've shown some of the interconnections between different struggles and how feminist values might infuse those and take us um, join us with other struggles for more systemic change. I think that's come across very well. So I'm very pleased with that. And thank you, everybody, for your time and for your attention. Um, and uh, hopefully see uh, most of you, uh, certainly some of you on Saturday at Fazlane Peace Camp. Bye, everyone.